Hi, I'm Dr. James Johnson. Tonight, I'd like to do something a little different. Tonight is fireside chat, and I'd like to talk about something very, very important. I want to talk about a lawsuit where someone actually lost their vision. Shocking, right? Why am I talking about this? It was not my patient. So this last year, 2022, I was asked to be an expert witness in a lawsuit in Virginia. And it goes down like this. A, a gentleman in his early 70s um, went to his local doctor in West Virginia, and that doctor, a glaucoma specialist, said, um, yes, you have floaters. I know they're bothering you. There's a guy over in Virginia who treats eye floaters. So uh, this patient, trusting his local doctor, went to Virginia to this vitreal retinal specialist and um, got the evaluation. And uh, this doctor says, yes, I can treat you. We can treat you right now. So I got him all set up, I got him dilated, he's all ready to go, and he proceeded to do a treatment. This was on a Friday. Saturday morning, the patient is not seeing as well. Something is wrong. Vision's a little cloudy, he says. So he tries to track down the doctor, gets the answering service, finally gets in touch with the doctor. The doctor says, well, come on in on Monday, and uh, we'll take a look. So he does, shows up on Monday, and they go through the usual screening, visual acuity, um, Prior to the procedure, his vision was 2020. Now it's 2040. That's worse. Um, the uh, young woman who is the ophthalmic technician uses a handheld uh, pressure measuring device and checks his pressure. Uh, the pressure measures at 18. Okay, that seems normal. So the patient goes on uh, to talk to the patient, to talk to the doctor, and the doctor says, well, you know, the vision's down, and that's normal, but, but the floaters look better. The floaters definitely look better, and tries to reassure the patient and says, you know, uh, come back in six weeks, and we'll do the other eye. So patient is compliant and follows directions, sort of. So about uh, four weeks later, this patient returns back to the office, kind of on an urgent visit, and says, I, I'm not seen out of my, my left eye. And so uh, the, it goes through the usual process, comes in. Uh, visual acuity now is shockingly worse, not even on the chart. I mean, it's off the chart. Uh, it is now just light perception. What does that mean? That means that the patient can tell that a light is being shown into his eye. This is just one step short of no light perception, which is, of course, true blind. This, this person is blinded, right? So um, the doctor checks the eye pressure, and it measured at 72. The handheld device measured 18, so the, the technician says. Uh, the doctor measures at 72. This is, oh, we have a visitor. By the way, this is not even my cat, but has taken a liking to me. So anyways... Um, the, the doctor brings him in and, 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 and basically blames the elevated pressure on a previous cataract surgery done, you know, a couple years prior where there was a little bit of vitreous strand kind of coming forward there. Like I've done cataract surgery. Uh, this is a relatively minor, uh, mishap. It, it doesn't cause elevated eye pressures. It doesn't cause loss of visual acuity. It can cause some mac. I take that back. It can cause some macular edema. And there's a very simple uh, snip, snip with the laser to to cut that little strand. And usually everything resolves. So, um, uh, anyways, uh, the doctor sets him up for blames the previous cataract complications of the previous cataract surgery. Sets up the patient for an emergency vitrectomy the next morning. Patient does so, the vitrectomy goes okay, um, but the patient never, you know, eventually they get the pressure under control and the pressure comes down and um, the patient essentially loses vision in that eye. So fast forward, I don't know, a year, a year and a half later or so, and I'm contacted by uh, this patient's, the plaintiff's attorneys in a, in a malpractice lawsuit. And I have a discussion with the attorneys and they're like, you know, Dr. Johnson, uh, we'd like to retain you. Um, and what we were kind of hoping the strategy would be that you would be able to say that this was clearly a breach of the standard of care. Uh, why? Here's why. The doctor delivered probably about, probably about two and a half times more energy, more shots, more energy than I've ever done in any one session. Like, and I thought I was pretty aggressive. Like I have done some, you know, arguably some pretty, pretty aggressive treatments. And I've never delivered that much energy. 
And I said, yeah, that's, that's way more than I would have ever have done. And I think you could talk to Dr. Geller, you could talk to Dr. Singh, you'd talk about to anybody with experience, I don't think they would have ever delivered that much energy. Um, I said, but here's the problem. There is no standard of care. I can say I can, I, I, that's beyond what I would be comfortable with, but I can't say that the American Academy of Ophthalmology, the American Medical Association, even the laser manufacturer has a standard that you can't exceed. And I said, that's, that's going to be challenging. I mean, we go for the drama, drama and say, this was more than I've ever delivered in my 16 years of treatment. We could do that. I said, here's what I think is the real problem. Um, I think really what it comes down to is the doctor not really knowing what he doesn't know, right? Um, and that is that the treatment can, in some cases, and I probably get maybe two to three cases a year with some elevation of pressure, not like this, but you know, some elevation of pressure that might need, where the patient might need to go on some eye drops. But um, if anybody were to come to my practice and have a treatment, and then in the first few days or so have any sort of complaint whatsoever, I would think of three things. Three things on my differential diagnosis. Eye pressure, eye pressure, or eye pressure. I mean, there's just really nothing else in that short term that could cause you know, hazy, cloudy, diffuse, you know, decrease in visual acuity. So, um, and that was kind of my strategy was um, the doctor wasn't thinking, you know? Uh, they were relying on, a, on, on, you know, Susie, the ophthalmic technician's measurement with a handheld device, which is notoriously not accurate at very low pressures and very high pressures, right? It's pretty good as a screening tool in the, in the mid range there, in the normal range, maybe slightly higher, but at the very extremes, the, the problem was the doctor just wasn't thinking about it. And so, um, you know, unlike TV shows where you go immediately to jury trial, you know, you do a deposition and this, and we're able to do a deposition via Zoom. Now, I had the privilege, of course, of reading all of the, uh, the previous depositions and all the, 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 the complaints and everything uh, uh, thus far. I even had the opportunity to read through a prior deposition with another floater treatment specialist. Um, and what I came to realize is that this defense attorney is kind of a ball buster, right? I mean, she really goes after you, right? Looks for, looks for weaknesses to punch through, right? So I was not going to be ill-prepared. So. <laughs> In doing the Zoom meeting, what they couldn't see is that I had notes all over. I taped up all over the place. You know, all the things that I wanted to say, that the timelines, all the, the names of all the documents that I had read, like I was going to be prepared. And I was. I was very proud of that. So we get through the deposition. And if you've ever been through something like that, you know, or in a, in a court, or what you see is like, you know, please just answer the question. You know, answer yes, no, just please answer the details of the question. So you're kind of limited. Uh, you can't go monologuing, you know. Uh, except if there's a, a brief opportunity when the doors open briefly, you can stick your foot in there so they can't close it. And, uh, and that's essentially what I did with a few opportunities near the end, um, where I started, uh, I started monologuing, right? And it would be, uh, something like talking about what would be my first, what would be my three things that I would be thinking about? Pressure, pressure, pressure. You know, I would be checking it myself. I wouldn't be relying on somebody else's measurements and so on and so forth. So uh, I think I, I was very proud of what uh, of, the, of my and, and, and I, it's the first time I've ever done something like this. I was very proud of it. I really felt like I advocated for this patient who I think he got a, uh, he got a real raw deal. Um, and I found out that the case settled about three or four weeks afterwards. I don't know the amount and the sum. It doesn't matter. He's never going to get his vision back. Uh, but I can tell you that that doctor is probably not going to be treating floaters. Um, so what's the take home from this? Um, if I were, um, uh, if maybe if I were a better businessman, I would never be talking about complications because I don't want to scare you away. But the reality is that's part of medicine, right? I mean, it's not, it's not an exact science. It is an art. And the reality is, is this, if this were easy, everybody would be doing it. Um, but here's some interesting observations, I think. So, uh, if any of you have been following me or know my, my backstory, I, uh, I, I've been treating eye floaters exclusively in my practice for 16 years. The first 14 and a half or so, um, I was in Southern California, in Irvine. And uh, right around the beginning of the, of the pandemic, I had it in my head that I want to buy a house, I was out of a divorce, and, 
And housing is just not affordable in Southern California. And I didn't want to get into that situation of like living above your means and, and paying ridiculous amounts for, for a house. So I started looking around. I decided to move to, to uh, North Texas here in, in Dallas area, Dallas Fort Worth area. And uh, so I moved my practice, you know, during a worldwide pandemic when there are travel restrictions and everything. So, you know, I hit the ground not running, but, you know, kind of crawling. You know, business was slower here in, in Texas. And I figured, well, I moved and it's a pandemic, right? Um, and I was busy doing other things, uh, landscaping, getting the house in order. What I didn't realize, it really kind of caught me off guard, was there's a lot of doctors treating floaters now. Um, in part, I kind of blame the laser manufacturer who is telling everybody, hey, you know, our laser treats floaters. And um, really, is this what we're going to do here? Yeah. Um, this laser treats floaters. You know, uh, get our laser. You need a YAG laser, of course, for everything else that you do. Um, you can treat floaters. And so, um, in fact, even just recently, a couple weeks ago, I decided, hey, I'm going to do a little Google search. I, and I Googled, um, you know, eye floater treatment, California. And I was, I was amazed. There was just a list of doctor after doctor after doctor. People I've never heard of, but, you know, apparently everybody with a YAG laser, everybody with this particular type of YAG laser is, is treating floaters. And it's also interesting because on my registration paperwork, uh, when you come in as a patient, I've got a two page, you know, very simple uh, a form uh, to fill out. And one of those questions has always been, have you had previous treatment for floaters? For 14 years or so, that was always left blank with a few exceptions. But for the most part, you know, nobody had had previous treatment. They're coming to me for their, for their first treatment. And that's just kind of what I expected. And that has been changing. So uh, more and more people have had some previous treatments. Or people are contacting me and like, yeah, I had my treatment in, in Kansas City or Chicago or whatever. And um, when I have a chance to talk to that patient, usually when they're in my office, I'll kind of lean in and I'll say, so what was that experience like for you? You know, I just kind of want to get a feel for what, what's going on there. And, and very often they'll say, oh, it was very quick. Uh, the doctor spent maybe about five minutes or so. And, uh, and I'm like, well, how many shots of the laser do you think? And they're like, I don't know, 80? 60, 80, maybe more than 80, but you know, less than 100. And I'm like, you know, for point, three, for point of reference, it'd be very common for me to fire 600, 800, maybe even 1,000 shots. Um, that's just what you need to do. Now, I wouldn't blame anybody for being conservative in their treatments because you do have to kind of build up that, but you have to build up to that. And the way that you build up to that is do a lot of treatments. Um, I've been doing this again, 16 years, exclusively treating floaters. I have probably done, uh, at last, in fact, for this deposition, I had to kind of prepare, uh, over 12,000 procedures. How many times have I fired the laser? I don't know, 15 million, 18 million, a ton. And I'll tell you, with that much experience, I've never had anybody lose vision, require surgery to fix anything. Um, uh, I have had patients with elevated pressures, manage them, you know, manage them appropriately with drops. They might be on drops for a few months or so, and then it goes away. Uh, nobody's ever had a permanent elevation eye pressure. I've had a pretty good run. Um, but it's still hard. Like this last week, I had a woman uh, who's Brazilian, lives in Southern California. She came out here to see me. She, she, she um, delivers food with Uber Eats or, or DoorDash or whatever. So she worked extra hours and really, really saved her money coming to me just desperate for relief. And um, I did a first treatment on Monday. It was hard. She's had, she'd had multiple optical challenges, previous PRK, previous LASIK, I'm sorry, previous RK with the, the, the incisions, uh, PRK, uh, a multifocal lens implant, and pupils that wouldn't dilate very well. It was like the perfect storm of optical challenges. And I could get some of the stuff in the front half of the eye, but the, I think the stuff that was really bothering her was in that back posterior aspect there. I couldn't even get at it. Couldn't even see it clearly, right? So she comes back after day number one, and she's like, eh, Dr. Johnson, it's not that much better. And I took a look in there again. I fired, the shot, I fired a few shots in there a, a bit, and I just said, you know, I don't think I can deliver value for you. Like here, and now, I have, now that you've come back with that feedback, now I have a better understanding of what's going on. Uh, and I don't think further treatment makes, makes much sense here. And furthermore, uh, since I'm not delivering value here, um, I, I don't want you to pay me. Oh, Dr. Johnson, I should pay you something. No. Um, 
The way I look at it is this. She has nobody to trust except for me for my recommendation to treat. I want to honor that. I want to do the right thing. Uh, and even though I tried and couldn't deliver the value, I don't feel like I should be taking her money. And in fact, I said, um, save that money and use it towards a vitrectomy because I think that's the only way they're going to be able to get that cleared out there. <laughs> and good luck to the vitreoretinal surgeon trying to, trying to, um, trying to, to work on that eye because the optics were really, really bad. Anyways, um, I probably shouldn't be telling this story. I don't want to scare people away from the practice, but, um, so what, you know, what are the take home messages? Um, there's a lot of doctors treating floaters now. I totally get the logistics. I totally get the finances, uh, the trust and the hope and the optimism of going to somebody local. And some of these doctors, by the way, are accepting insurance. Okay. Um, but I don't think that they have the skill set. I don't think they have the experience. And since they're just dabbling with the treatment of floaters, I don't think they're, they're going to get the experience. In no way they're going to catch up to me. Um, but I totally understand why someone would try to go to somebody local. Um, the problem is that if you don't have the experience, you don't know what you don't know. You know not only not you don't know how to do the difficult stuff, but if there's a complication, like in this case with the uh, elevated eye pressure. Um, but he didn't, he didn't even, he didn't even think of it. Didn't even think of it. And in that case, because it was neglected, uh, this patient did have some, men, uh, some depression, some other mental health issues. And so maybe that, maybe you say, well, why didn't he go in earlier? Well, you know what? I'm not here to judge that person. You don't know. Um, you don't know what you don't know. You don't have the skill set. Um, and so if you're looking to some, for somebody to treat your floaters, you should go to the person that has the most experience and will treat you fair. It's not a money back guarantee. That's just saying, look, if I can't deliver value, I don't think that I should be, I don't, I don't think that I should get paid. Um, and what else? Okay. Let's say that you already had treatment. I'm not sure why you're looking at videos about treatment, but let's say you had treatment that was equivocal. It was just like really not that much improvement, maybe a little bit, but not that much. And you might say, well, I guess it doesn't work for me. And the doctor says, well, I guess after two or three treatments, I guess it doesn't really work for you. And for a lot of people, that's probably where it ends. Unfortunately, those patients might actually be good uh, candidates for treatment with safe and successful treatment with somebody who has the experience and knows what they're doing. Um, so if that's you, you might still consider the inconvenience and the expense of coming all the way to, uh, to North Texas um, I don't think anybody will try harder. I don't think anybody has a better set of skills. I don't think anybody will treat you more fair. Um, ultimately, you have to be your own advocate. So, you know, uh, this is why you're here. If you've made it this far in the video, like, you know, bravo, because this is it's a long story to tell. But uh, hopefully it's an interesting one. I think mostly I want it to be educational. Uh, I'm always trying to educate and manage people's expectations. And if you are considering treatment, uh, consider it worthwhile to make the, the trip. That's my story. That's my fireside chat. Um, and if you have questions, you know, you're always welcome to contact me. Email, mail at thefloaterdoctor.com. Um, you can also leave some comments here. If, if you look through my videos and look through the comments, I try to answer pretty much all of the comments. It takes a lot of time, um, but it just shows, uh, I guess, kind of my dedication to the craft and and that I get it, right? I get the floater problem, right? I've dedicated my entire career to it, so I better get it. Um, yeah, contact me, and, uh, and, and by the way, if you decide you wanna come and see me, go through the website, there's tons of information there, but you can actually book your own appointments. I have an, an app on my website. You pick a date, pick a couple dates. Anyways, this has been a pleasure. It's been a change of pace. This is a kind of a prop. I want to give this this warm winter feeling, but there's actually a little bit of uh, Jack Daniels and honey in there. It's pretty good. Um, look forward to seeing you in person. Let's get those floaters taken care of. And boy, if you've made it this far, thanks. I appreciate it. Help other people find me. Uh, you do that by either subscribing or hitting the like button. You know, the usual, you've heard it from every other uh, YouTuber. Uh, but it does, it helps me, thank you. I'm not monetized, not yet, but mostly it helps other people who are trying to do their due diligence and their research 
it helps them uh, helps them find me. And that's that way you're helping them as well. So thank you very much. Have a nice winter. Happy holidays to y'all.